Today we're gonna to discuss how to plan and design your own custom pinhole camera. And in future episodes, I'm going to walk you step-by-step step through how I'm going to build my 8x10 super wide pinhole camera, as well as adapt a pinhole lens board to the Intrepid 8x10 camera. Hey fellow photographers, what did you photograph today? Now at first glance, a pinhole camera seems fairly simple. It's really just a dark box. On one hand you have a pinhole, and on the other end you have some sort of film or photographic paper or some light sensitive material. But when you want to create your own pinhole camera, the possibilities are endless. I'm going to walk you through my thought process when it comes to building pinhole cameras, and hopefully it will inspire you to go out and create your own. I like to consider three major factors when it comes to designing a pinhole camera. First and foremost is the format that you're going to be using. Second is going to be the focal length of the pinhole camera. And third is going to be the location of the pinhole itself. Let's talk about format. One of the first things you should consider when creating a pinhole camera is what format you want to use, whether it be film or paper. When it comes to film, you pretty much have two options, sheet film or roll film. If you're building a pinhole camera from scratch, I recommend the use of sheet film. Sheet film is easier to work with because when you have to deal with rolled film, such as 35mm film or medium format 120 film, you have to have some sort of mechanism that will help wind and possibly unwind the film within your pinhole camera. If you want to use roll film like 35mm or medium format film, I would consider actually going a different route. Instead of building a pinhole camera from scratch completely, perhaps take an existing camera or something that uses film backs and adapt a pinhole body cap to that camera. For example, we have this 120 roll film back, which is a medium format back that fits onto this Hasselblad, and we can just simply make or buy a pinhole body cap that solves our issue. Now the winding mechanism for the advancing the film is already contained in this thing that's built for you, uh, but you still have the pinhole camera. Now roll film does have its advantages, the biggest of which is that you can get multiple exposures per roll. Because it's a roll, you take a, you know, take a photograph, wind the film, take another photograph, wind the film. You're not constantly replacing sheets all of the time. So it does have that major advantage. But the major disadvantage of roll film is the smaller format. 35 millimeter and medium format films are much smaller in comparison to sheet films like 4x5, 5x7, and 8x10 films. And because pinhole images naturally produce a soft image, when you use a smaller film format, in order to get the same size print, you're going to have to magnify the smaller image much more. You have many more times magnification to get, let's say, an 8x10 print, whereas a 4x5 sheet film is only two times magnification to get to 8x10, and an 8x10 camera can actually just contact print straight from the 8x10 negative. Remember that when we magnify an image from a small image frame, like 35 millimeter, we are actually going to exaggerate all of those flaws, defects, and in the case of pinholes, the softness of the image. So let's talk about some sheet film options. Now there are some pre-made sheet film options like this. This is the Ilford Obscura, which is a 4x5 pinhole camera. It's a simple, pretty simple little box. There's a little pinhole in the front that you can view once you remove this sort of makeshift shutter that's held in by magnets. And I like to call this sort of style, uh, sort of a shoebox style, because it kind of, it's held in together by magnets and it kind of, you know, looks like a, some sort of shoebox or something that you would put something in. And this is a pretty decent solution. It's relatively affordable. But the issue with this is to load each sheet of film, you'll have to take apart this camera in complete darkness. And you'll have to take a sheet of four by five film, place it in the camera, close back the camera, Take your image and when you want to remove the film to take another image you have to do all of this again in the dark take this out put this in a light tight box so that it doesn't get exposed put your other sheet in close it back up take this out of the dark bag and go back to photographing with your pinhole camera so the issue here is that you have to carry a bunch of extra gear with you in the name of like a, a dark room sort of changing bag or something it's not the most practical thing to do in the field. So for that reason, I like to design pinhole cameras around film holders. Now film holders are, you know, not as big as, uh, you know, you can pack a bunch of these into your backpack or whatever you're traveling with. You don't have to have your changing bag with you because you can load them at home. 
in your changing bag or if you're lucky enough to have a dark room, you can load them there and you can take all the film holders with you and then come back and unload them all to develop your film. So you really just need this and you can take as many as you have or that you need for whatever you're photographing that day. And these are little self-contained, you know, light tight film holders. I mean, this is what, you know, view cameras like this use. Um, so if you build your camera around this that accepts these, and these are universal among all the manufacturers that built the specific specifications, if you use these, it's much easier. So for example, in this camera that I've built here, it accepts on the back a film holder. So the film holder simply slots into the back, presses up nice and firm, and now we have the camera. So we just put in our film back, we cover the pinhole, we open the dark slide to expose the film, we make our exposure, close the pinhole, slide this back down, and we're good to go. And then we can just you know, move to the next scene, flip this over, because each one holds one sheet on each side, and we can go about our merry way, and we're not fiddling with the dark bag in between every single shot. So hopefully I've done a good job of sort of making my case for the use of sheet film in pinhole photography, how it's going to give you a bigger negative area to work with, which will require less enlargement for the same size print as the smaller formats. And because film holders are readily available and they're relatively inexpensive and you really only need, you know, a few because, you know, you're not going to be making, you know, unless you plan on making tons and tons of exposures, you know, film holders are an economical way to have multiple shots without having to do all the hassle of the Ilford Obscura having to unload each sheet one at a time. So now that we've talked about format, let's talk about focal length. So remember that in a pinhole camera, such as this one, the focal length is really going to be determined by the sort of the projection distance between where the pinhole sits, which is right about here, and where the film plane is here. So this distance here is going to be our focal length. It's really a projection distance, but we use focal length as a proxy for projection distance because technically there is no focal length in a pinhole camera because there's no focal point because there's no lens to focus light to any specific point. Because there's no lens, it's a projection distance, but again, we're just gonna use focal length interchangeably. And remember also that because it's a pinhole, not a lens, it produces a rectilinear image, which means that light rays are just gonna come straight through the pinhole in all different directions, and they're gonna produce a rectilinear projection on the film surface. Compare this to sort of a fisheye lens, which actually bends light you know, in all different directions and gives that sort of circular globe fisheye look, this is going to be a rectilinear lens. And some lenses that you may have seen for your cameras, they may have very, very small focal lengths, but they'll actually be fisheye lenses. It's very difficult to make a super wide angle lens that's a rectilinear projection. I think Canon makes one for their 35 millimeter or full frame format, which is a 11 millimeter at the shortest end, which is very, very wide for a rectilinear image. So when you're considering focal length, I urge you to think about a couple things. First and foremost, what focal length do you take most of your photographs at? Now, for a lot of people, this is sort of like the normal or standard lens for that format. In full frame or 35 millimeter, that's about your 50 millimeter, your nifty 50 lens is sort of your normal lens. And by normal, we mean kind of gives you a idea of about what the human eye registers or sees normally, right? So this is what a, a, a print would look like sort of if you were surveying the scene through your own eyes. That's pretty much the standard normal focal length definition. A lot of times it's defined by the diagonal of the film format that you're using. So in the case of 35 millimeter, it's a 24 by 36 millimeter frame size. And essentially that diagonal is close to 46 something millimeters. In the case of four by five, it's closer to about 150, 152 millimeters. Doesn't have to be exact. In the case of eight by 10, it's closer to 300, 325, something like that. So that's your normal lens range. So when you make your projection distance, you wanna keep that in mind. Anything shorter than that is going to be a wider angle of view. Anything longer than that is gonna give you a telephoto angle of view. The second thing I want you to consider is what focal lengths would you like to shoot at, but maybe you don't have the funds for a lens, you know, usually on the, the wider ends of the spectrum, the super wide lenses and the super telephoto lenses, they can get very, very expensive. So maybe you have your kit lens, maybe you have your nifty 50 lens or whatever the equivalent is in the, in the format that you're using, 
but you want to go super wide or you want to go super telephoto, but those lenses are just out of your price point. Well, pinhole cameras are an affordable solution to that. They aren't going to give you the same quality as a lens, of course, but at least you get to experiment with those very wide or very long focal lengths without having to break the bank. The last thing I want you to think about in terms of focal length is what is actually optically possible for the format that you're using. I'll give you an example. This Intrepid 8x10 camera has the Nikkor 120 millimeter lens on it. Now this lens, as far as I know, is one of the widest, if not the widest, that will actually cover uh, an 8x10 field of view. So when we talk about lens coverage, you may have a super wide lens, but it may not be able to project at a wide enough angle to cover your entire film plane. And that's the case here. This lens barely covers 8x10, which means we're gonna get some vignetting in the corners and whatnot. But as far as lenses go, this is pretty much the lower limit of lenses that have been produced for 8x10 cameras that are able to cover such a large area. Now the beauty of pinholes are that if you have a pinhole that is the right size made of a very, very thin material because it's the thickness of the material that's really gonna dictate how wide the projection angle is going to be. If you have a really, really thin material used for your pinholes, you can actually get very, very large angles of view, very, very large coverage, even though your pinhole may be very, very close to the film plane, giving you a very small focal length. So for this month and for this year's Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day, I've focused on, I'm going to design and build an 80 millimeter 8x10 pinhole camera which is extremely, extremely wide. It's about 11 or 12 millimeters on a full frame camera. The last thing I wanna talk about is the location of the pinhole. This camera here, I'm going to be mim mimicking this design, this exact design. I'm gonna take you exactly how I built this exact camera. I'm gonna build one essentially twice as big. So it's gonna be eight by 10 instead of four by five. Um, and what you have to think of when it comes to this is where you place the pinhole. Now. I'm probably gonna go with the same design here, which is sort of front and center, right in the middle of the image plane. This is probably the most common location for a pinhole, right in the middle of the frame. But because you're building your own camera from scratch, you can actually position this pinhole, wherever this sort of circle cut out with the pinhole is, you can make it higher, uh, you can make it lower. And the beauty of this is you probably just make it higher, and if you want it lower, you just turn it upside down, and if you want it to the side, you turn it on its side, et cetera, et cetera but essentially you can mimic some of the movements of a view camera by placing the pinhole in different locations. Now, what would that do for the image? If you place the pinhole higher up, you're actually going to get more of the top of the image and less of the bottom. So, you know, if you're taking pictures of tall buildings, maybe you want a pinhole that is higher on your film plane. If you're gonna do a lot of architectural stuff, that would be a great way to put your pinhole. You can use the same camera with the pinhole up here and turn it upside down. Let's say if you're going to the Grand Canyon and you were looking down into the canyon and you wanted to keep this pretty much level, you don't want a picture of just the horizon half canyon and a bunch of blue sky. You can have maybe a third sky and two thirds of the ground below you, depending on where you place the pinhole. For this year, I'm gonna keep it simple. I'm gonna keep the standard formula of keeping the pinhole in the center, but remember, that you can actually incorporate a fixed movement into your pinhole camera design. And I've even seen pinhole cameras that have multiple pinholes, maybe in a row or even side to side, and you just, you know, you cover them all up and you open the one you want for that specific photograph. So you can actually choose which pinhole. But we're gonna keep it simple, just one pinhole in the center of the image. Hopefully that's enough information to get you started thinking about what kind of pinhole camera that you wanna design. If you wanna follow along while I build my pinhole camera, which will serve as a really good sort of base foundation for a sheet film pinhole camera, make sure you're subscribed to this channel with notifications enabled because those videos are coming out very soon, just in time for Worldwide Pinhole Photography Day. I hope you join me and until I see you next time, as always, happy photographing.